Well, everybody, we are back. Monster Kid Radio, the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear, is back. We are finally back. I took a little bit of a break, kind of unannounced, went on a hiatus, did the whole getting married thing, and and I tell you, that was pretty awesome. But it put everything on hold as we were getting married, as we were moving. I'm still not 100% settled in at the house, but, you know, we're making progress every day. We're, we're trying to put things where they belong and get this place set up so that we can become fully functional as a production site for all things Monster Kid Radio and Team Death. And there's a lot of things going on, but it's been so long since I've done an episode of MKR, and it's been so long since I sat down to watch Manos the Hands of Fate. It was just time. It was time to put on the virtual master robes. No, I don't own a robe from the master from Manos the Hands of Fate. Yet, someday I would love one, but you know what? In the meantime, I've got the movie, and I've got somebody I'm going to share the movie with. Before we get to that, though, I want to let you know that the song that you're hearing right now, we've played it on the show in the past. It is from the band The Seatopians. It is their song, Manos, The Hands of Fate. You can find it on their album, Underwater Ally, and you can find them over at theseatopians.bandcamp.com. We played the song in the past. They've given us permission to play their music here on the podcast in the past. We're playing it again, so please go check out their Bandcamp site and check out all of their work, all of their albums. Not just this song, although this song is thematically appropriate for not just this week, but next week and the week after that as well, as we really get our Monos groove on. Now, we also have Mark Matsky's Beta Capsule Review. Can't do an episode of Monster Kid Radio without that. And Kenny's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. That's happening here as well. Now, let's talk a little bit more about Manos. Now, during the conversation I'm going to have with this week's guest, I'm going to tell you why this movie means so much to me, why it's special. And honestly, I don't know if I do a good enough job or not trying to explain to my wife. Yeah, I get to call her my wife now, which is awesome. Beth, who is this week's special guest. I get to sit down with her and talk about why this movie means so much to me, why it speaks to me and resonates with me. And honestly... I don't know if I did a good enough job. So, you know, we're going to keep talking Manos. It's not just this week. Like I said a second ago, we're talking about Manos for the next three episodes. So strap in, buckle up, do whatever it is that Manos requires you to do, and get ready for part one of our Manos coverage here on MKR. Let's go ahead and get into all of that after Kenny and after Mark right now. Lugosi's Dracula, Monsters from Under the Sea, Atomic Frankensteins, and Grandpa Monster 2. Classic monster memorabilia vendors, movie and TV stars, signing autographed photos. It's all coming to the Marriott Pittsburgh North, June 16th through the 18th, 2023. It's Monster Bash! Fans who grew up with monster movies in the theater and on TV will descend on the Marriott Pittsburgh North. Hundreds and hundreds of fans. Don't you scare miss out as fans travel from all over the country to meet, shop, and enjoy classic monster entertainment. Coming to Monster Bash in June, Audrey Dalton, star of The Monster That Challenged the World, and Boris Karloff's thriller TV shows. Charlotte Austin, who starred in Frankenstein 1970 with Karloff, and Ed Wood's The Bride and the Beast. Lynn Lugosi Sparks, the granddaughter of Dracula himself, Bela Lugosi. Daniel Roebuck, star of countless films, TV's Matlock, and Grandpa Munster in the latest Munsters movie. Plus, he's a super fan and collector of classic monster memorabilia. Beverly Washburn, actress in Spider Baby with Lon Chaney Jr., Thriller, and Disney's Old Yeller. Tom Savini, actor, makeup man, special effects genius, with credits that include Creep Show, Tales from the Dark Side, The Black Phone, and so much more. Pamela Pierce, actress and daughter of the director that brought us The Legend of Boggy Creek. John Russo, co-writer and zombie from the original Night of the Living Dead, the origin of the modern zombie and Ohio TV horror host legend, the one and only Son of Ghoul, still creeping to TV sets after all these years. 
plus Cleveland horror hosts Drac and Countess Corita. Monster Bash is wall-to-wall vendors at a giant horror hotel packed with classic monster movie fans. Don't miss out. Three-day VIP admission is $55 in advance or $60 at the door for all three packed days. Single-day admission at the door is $25. It's all at the Pittsburgh Marriott North, Friday through Sunday, June 16th through the 18th, 2023. Get your advanced membership admission online at creepyclassics.com. That's creepyclassics.com. More information is available at monsterbash.us or call 724-238-4317. It's Monster Bash. It's coming, the world's craziest fun and fright show, The Lemon Grove Kids Meet the Monster. It's so scary, so crazy, we dare you to see it. We dare you to see The Lemon Grove Kids Meet the Monsters. The screen's funniest and wildest teenagers in the craziest fun and fright show you've ever seen. Crazy, weird, and frightening movie monster. Not only on the screen, but in the audience, alive and in person. See the horrifying mad mummy come to life and go into the audience to get you. We warn you, don't come if you're chicken. This show is not for sissies. If you're not afraid, be sure to see the world's craziest fun and fright show, The Lemon Grove Kids Meet the Monster. A thousand and one laughs, thrills, and chills. In widescreen and Eastman color. Enterprise log. Captain James Kirk commanding. We are leaving that vast cloud of stars and planets which we call our galaxy. The question, what is out there in the black void beyond? This is Captain Kirk of the USS Enterprise. Is there anyone on board? Is there anyone on board? Have you raised anyone, Lieutenant? Nothing, sir. It is an unmanned probe which seems to be carrying a warhead. William Shatner stars as Captain Kirk and Leonard Nimoy as science officer Spock on Star Trek in color. Live from the land of light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty ultra heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. Return of Ultraman, Episode 13, Terror of the Tsunami Monster, Tokyo in Peril. Original air date, June 25th, 1971. The transport vessel Kaijin, carrying a three-ton shipment of opals and sapphires from Australia, is attacked by sea monster Seamons. MAT locates the only survivors, among whom is the ship's captain, Pops Takamura. Blamed for the disaster, Pops, who is in shock, can only repeat the name Simons, leading his daughter Yoko to explain to investigators the folk tales told about Simons and its companion monster, Sigaroth. Although met with skepticism, Takamura is proven right when two fishermen report a sighting of Simons near Hachijojima Island, which sends monster attack team to seek out the creature. After persuading Yoko Takamura to work with them, MAT gets word of Simon's appearance in Tokyo Bay. The quadrupedal monster comes ashore, laying waste to a shipyard, but remembering a South Seas folk song about Simon's, MAT decides not to endanger the kaiju with further attacks. This is not acceptable to the shipyard owner, who enlists the military to bomb the monster. MAT cannot prevent the bombing, which ignores the advice of the folk song, which says to bother Simons is to provoke the anger of Sigaroth. Upon hearing Simons anguished cries, Sigaroth unleashes a devastating tsunami, which monster attack team is powerless to prevent. Episode 13 is part one of a two-part story arc. Together with episode 14, it was released as a feature film called Return of Ultraman, Fear of the Tornado Monsters, 
as part of the December 1971 Champion Festival, along with an abbreviated version of Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster and other movies for kids. It was a great choice for a theatrical release with high production values and an opening sequence that seems like a deliberate homage to Godzilla of 1954. Featured in a prominent guest starring role as ship's captain Pops Takamura is Akiji Kobayashi, well known to Ultraman fans as another captain, the science special search party's Toshio Muramatsu, Captain Mura, in the English dub. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Matsky reporting. seconds for the flesh eaters to strip the last bit of flesh from any living thing. Once they sense it, they lead their way to anything that comes between them and their meat. They stood alone, surrounded by the most abominable threat ever faced by human beings. Don't touch those things! I need bandages, strips of cloth, anything! Quickly! Uh. One by one, half mad with terror, they turned upon each other. You killed her! Animal! You will lie down in one of the contaminated areas and be our guinea pig. What was the dread secret of this horror that was born out of science and madness? Was there no way to escape? The Flesh Eaters. Santa Claus conquers the Martians. Santa sets up a fantastic automatic toy factory on Mars. The Martian leader battles the wicked Bodar in a desperate effort to save Santa. The Wise Man of Mars. 900 years old. The Battle of the Toys, when Martian kids and Earth kids join Santa to battle the bad guys of Mars. age fun, you'll be out of this world when Santa Claus conquers the Martians. Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. This month, we are taking a closer look at the misunderstood classic, Mano's Hands of Fate. This film was never covered by FM, but it wasn't because Foray was shy about featuring misunderstood films. In fact, the pages of FM were filled with photos and articles of any movie that wanted to promote itself and famous monsters. This month, we will take a look at several of them and see how FM sung their praises, most of the time sight unseen. First up is an encore presentation, which we heard during MKR 497 in what I proudly consider one of my best written segments, dedicated to a really bad movie, The Creeping Terror. 
Let's hear this essay on how FM's write-up of this film may have affected a young FM reader in 1964. Today, I want to take you back in time. It is 1964, and you are a 10-year-old monster kid, in the perfect time to be a monster kid. All of culture is reaching out to you to entice you into monster kid heaven. On TV, you have the Twilight Zone, the Outer Limits, and the brand new made-for-you Munsters and Adams Family. Don't forget your local horror host bringing the classics every week. The newsstands have both Famous Monsters and its sister magazine Monster World, among others. But the funnest place to get your Monster Kid fix was in the local movie theater. There was nothing better than being in a dark room with other Monster Kids screaming in delight at the latest horrorwood beastie to get you from the big screen. So far this year, you have been inundated with classics from Corman and Hammer. Last year, you were scared by The Haunting, thrilled by Jason and the Argonauts, mesmerized by King Kong vs. Godzilla. This year, you have spent more time in front of the boob tube. But there is nothing like the scintillating cinema experience. And you can count on famous monsters to give you a heads up on the latest thriller flick at the Bijou. The year is coming to an end. And FM 31 comes out. A photorealistic painting of Boris Karloff's Imhotep invites you into a world of monsters and mayhem. Your eyes scan the contents and you see this subtitle. Exclusive preview of Horrorwood's latest monster movie. That is what you're looking for. You flip to page 30 and find the title, The Next Scarefest, coming to your local cinema. The Creeping Terror. You scan the massive eight-page article, loaded with pictures of bloodied victims and a horrendous alien monster. You can only imagine how wonderful it will be. Will it move like a fantastic Harryhausen creature? Will it be like a Japanese monster destroying intricate miniature sets? You go to the beginning and begin to read the article, which dives directly into the thrilling story. Your heart races with glorious anticipation as you read about exciting scenes like this. Martin receives a call from Caldwell on his car radio. The creature has been sighted at Harrah's and the defenses are being sent in to hunt it down. The creature continues to seek out victims. It crawls yekily across the highway and into the woods and sights the bright glow of a drive-in movie theater. Attracted, the alien monster slithers toward it. Near the rear of the lot, a young couple has parked their car and are quite surprised to have the creature invade the vehicle and digest its occupants. And moving toward the illuminated movie screen, the creature accidentally terrifies a number of people in the automobiles, one of whom is idiotic enough to turn a spotlight on the alien monster. However, as the owner of the spotlight sees what is caught in the beam of light, he quickly regrets his mistake and leaps under the dashboard. But the creature, who doesn't particularly care for being put in the spotlight, apparently is not one to forgive human foibles. It advances with waving eye stalks and dripping mouth toward the car, and pokes its slimy head through the open window. The occupant yanks one of its eye stalks. The creature howls and swallows him. You can't wait! You scramble to your town's daily newspaper and head directly to the movie listings, and you see... It's here! Your Saturday is instantly planned, and the longest week of your life drones on minute by minute as you imagine the chills and thrills that await you. Your patience is tried and your character is built as you struggle to await for the moment the creeping terror begins. It is Saturday now, and you are seated in the theater, robotically eating your popcorn as you watch the trailers for future attractions. Each one seems to last hours as the anticipation for creeping terror grows and grows. And then it begins. The music and credits are odd. Something doesn't seem right. The painful feeling of disappointment begins to enter your gut. When the narration starts, the smell of Limburger cheese begins to invade your eyes and ears. This is not what you expected. Not at all. The monster makes an uncustomarily early and prolonged appearance, and all hope disappears. You have been ripped off. You quickly realize that the producers are rejoicing because they broke even with the 75 cents you paid for the movie. Every penny paid by the rest of the wide-eyed, dumbstruck monster kids is pure profit. Your mind begins to wander. Should I just leave? Join in the booing and jeering? You decide to close your eyes and wish. Wish it could be as scary as The Innocents. 
Wish it could be as awe-inspiring as The Incredible Shrinking Man. Wish it could be as thrilling as Invasion of the Body Snatchers. But nothing changes. As you watch a victim feed herself to the toilet seat mouth of the carpet monster, a deep feeling of sadness, anger, and disappointment overwhelms you. You return home, numbed by the experience. You take your famous Monsters 31 and decide to desecrate its hollowed pages. You grab pages 30 through 37 and rip them out. You have made the issue worthless, but it was worth it. You are comforted at the release of anger you manifested, and you feel satisfied that anyone in the future who comes upon this particular issue 31 of Famous Monsters will be saved from the experience you have just lived. You can only hope other monster kids are doing the same, hope that any vestiges of the creeping terror would be lost forever in 1964. Alas, it would not be, as evidenced by our show today. For indeed, 56 years later, we are still watching, and dare I say, appreciating, this horrendous pile of alien toilet mouth carpet monster. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next week. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. Oh, wow. Okay, normally I don't comment directly after Kenny's segment. I like to leave the segments to speak for themselves. But holy cow, dude, that was harsh. I mean, the creeping unknown is is tough. It's it's a rough one. Uh, I actually think it's more incompetent than Manos. And Manos, I mean, let's be honest, it's got its issues. But wow. Well, you know what? Say what you want to say about the movie. It just gave us a handful of minutes of entertainment here on MKR, so it did something, right? Right? Maybe? I... Uh, uh. Ugh. Incredible is the word for the world's first monster musical. <laughs> See in magnificent Eastman color, the daring, dancing, enticing, and horrifying, the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed-up zombies. Okay. Who is the woman branded in birth wearing the wart of horror? The world's first monster musical. The incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies. This is Count Vlad, but you may recognize me by my more familiar name, Count Dracula. And I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited. And occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. In your parlance, you might call these revelations spoilers. You know how the children of the night, ah, I mean monster kids, can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned. And don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky von Helsing. I don't know what the audio equivalent of blowing dust off of something to indicate time's <laughs> past is, so I, I'm not going to just blow on the mic, but imagine that that's what I'm doing right now, because we haven't recorded Monster Kid Radio in a while, and we are blazing back to the podosphere, to the pod waves, with a few episodes in a row of one of my favorite low-budget cult movies. I'm not going to say so bad it's good because I don't believe in that. I don't believe in guilty pleasures. This movie truly does entertain me. And I'm still married. Yeah, yeah, still married. <laughs> this recording is happening. Uh, I think this is the first time we've done an MKR, that I've done an MKR full discussion since the wedding. I think so, yeah. And I that sounds right. I intentionally waited to show this lovely woman here, Manos the Hands of Fate, until after the wedding, because well, because it's Manos the Hands of Fate. And I know a lot of people question my love for this film. I adore it, and we watched it last night. So one, how's your life different since we've been married? And two, has your life become even better now that you've watched Manos? Um, far fewer stairs since we're married, which is a 
definite plus. In ah, stairs my is book. A, okay, not, not like looks, but like climbing them to get home and away from home every day. Okay, so that's good. Uh, also, I you know have this great big wonderful guy that I get to lay down next to every night, which is lovely and. Uh, you know, I it's, it's pretty great. And I don't know why you waited. It's a cute, funny, silly little, like, movie. That is not, In its era. That's not the vibe that I was getting when we were watching it yesterday. Uh, it was I was six- absorbing it. I was trying to pay attention. And... But was 16 minutes in, you pulled out your phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was to actually check on something, but... Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's a little slow getting going. I will give people that. <laughs> that if, if you're 60 minutes in and you're like, yep, I've seen this a hundred times before in all those old, you know, dime movies that they used to have, sure. But no, it's it's a funny little romp and <laughs> the, the symbolism used in it is it's cute. It's, it's you know... It, it's what the kids would say. It's like if an AI was told to go back and write a cult horror classic movie from that area era, and it went back and perused the other material available. Wow. This is what it would come up with: a, a great amalgamation of various things. Wow. Okay. Okay. So a fun little romp. That should be on the movie poster. Yeah. It's a funny little romp. I love that. And as if an AI generated a horror movie. I could see that too. That makes a lot of sense, actually. And it, it didn't take itself too seriously. Like, well, it knew what it was and it just went for it. And, you know, uh, fun little twist at the end there. So I liked it. So I asked you, probably around the 16 minute mark, should I talk about the movie while we're watching it or should we wait until we're done? Because I didn't want to be that guy that. Every time somebody watches, is it the two towers, the minute Aragorn breaks his foot, everybody's like, oh, oh, look, he broke his foot for real on camera. I didn't want to do that while we were watching yeah. Monos. Uh, but there's a lot of things about the movie that I don't know if it will change your opinion, enhance your opinion, inform your opinion of the film. First thing, though, is I want to correct something that I did say yesterday. Mm. Uh, it wasn't the boy in the car making out that broke his leg. I did some double checking and the resources that I'm seeing now is actually it's the woman who had broken her leg beforehand, which is why she is not getting up and about. Uh, but they still were able to keep her in the movie by just keeping her stationary in the car. Okay. I'm referring to the couple that is constantly being cut back to and you see them make out a lot in the same clothes over the course of a couple of days. They don't have anywhere to go other than hey, their car. I mean, geez, it's it's like the seventies. What are they gonna do? Talk to each other? Like sixties, <laughs> but oh, it's fine. Sixties go bowling. I don't I don't know what else. <laughs> so Do you see that car? It has no back seat. There's nowhere for a bowling bag. <laughs> if only they could have gone bowling instead of going to Valley Lodge, everything would have been fine for Mike and Margaret and Debbie. Yeah. So uh the movie was made by Hal Warren, who was a fertilizer salesman. Popular knowledge is that he so made... He knew his... Uh, I'm not going to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Firmly, firmly, but... Uh, the, the popular knowledge or story is that he made a bet with a screenwriter that, oh, I could make a movie, and proceeded to make this movie using casts off of film from various editing houses and things like that, using the tales of a film, which is why there's no shot that lasts longer than 32 seconds in the film, because that's all they had. Also, <laughs> sound was not recorded live on set. It was all done in post. Oh, yeah, you can tell that, definitely. Yeah. But by the same three people for everybody in the film. Oh, okay. Two dudes and a woman. Uh, and there's even some stories that say that that third dude really didn't do his own dialogue anyway. So it's it's, it's all overdubbed. Um, this oh, that explains why all the women sound the same. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the city was very involved in the production. They were very thrilled to have a real-life horror movie being made. Hal Warren, the director who also played Mike, told everybody that any problems that happened would be fixed in post-production. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. When they held the premiere, he booked a theater. They made a huge deal out of it. He was given an honorary like deputy's badge from the police department. The mayor was there. He rented out those big spotlights. He rented, he could only afford one limo, 
So he would load up a bunch of casts in the limo. Drive them around, drop them off, and then drive around the corner and drive, yeah. Yep. I'm going to take a sad turn here, though, because one of the actors did not make it to the premiere. John Reynolds played Torgo. Yeah, brilliantly. He unfortunately committed suicide about a month before the premiere. Oh, no. Now, again, popular story is that he was fried during this movie on LSD. I can see that having seen the movie. I mean, it was kind of an era where a lot of people in the movie and music industry were doing things like that, unfortunately. Now, he was friends with Tom Neiman, who played the master. Okay. Yeah. Uh, from the theater community. So a lot of them were theater actors that got involved in this project. Uh, Tom Damon, the master, ended up actually writing some of his own dialogue. Uh, the prayers to Manos he wrote himself. Mm-hmm. His wife made the Manos robe. Ah. Uh, and a lot of the sculptures, the hand sculptures, were generated uh, by him and his family. Uh, his daughter played Debbie, who was, according to myth and according to the actress herself, one of only two performers who got paid for this film. Wow. That the little girl got a bike. But you care to guess who the other performer was who got paid for this movie? I don't know. The big dog, who was Debbie's dog, or Jackie's dog, it got paid a bag of dog food. Uh, oh, okay. The, the the cute dog. No. No? The big one. Oh, the scary dog. Yes. That was Debbie's actual... Who has a dog like that with small children? Uh, Hollywood, anyway. <laughs> Far from Hollywood. Um, he, How Warren paid everybody on set in shares of the film. Yeah. You know, we're, you're going to get a couple of profits. Yeah. That yeah. that didn't happen. So the movie starts playing during the premiere. People are watching it. And the cast and crew are mortified. Yeah. They're kind of slinking back to the back of the theater and slowly start leaving the theater yeah. before the movie's over because they don't want to face anybody after the yeah, movie's yeah, yeah. done. How Warren would go on later to say, well, I suppose we could recut it and redo the audio and make it a comedy. Okay. <laughs> that never happened. Yeah. Uh, he did pitch a second film called Bikers from the Desert or Riders from the Desert, something along those lines. It never went anywhere. But he won the bet that he could make a horror movie. Um now, the movie itself languished in obscurity for many, many years. And so you're lucky it didn't get tossed out on a back lot and right? burned somewhere. The only reason we know about it now, and it's become a thing, is because the producers of Mystery Science Theater 3000 were looking for content, found this thing somewhere, I don't know how they found it, and decided to do a riff on it and make it one of their episodes. Yeah. Somebody contacted Jackie, who played Debbie, grown-up Jackie, yeah. who then reached out to her dad and was like, could you believe somebody's seen this? Our movie is on TV. Yeah. And it slowly developed a cult following since then. And it's been riffed by a number of different people before. Uh, I don't own a lot of Mystery Science Theater 3000 discs, but one of the few ones that I do own is Monos. As much as I love the movie straight and I kind of have mixed feelings about MST3K, I do enjoy their presentation of it. And I will say that back in the diff back in the day, several years ago, when somebody got their hands on the original negatives of the film, they thought, you know what, this movie needs a Blu-ray restoration. (laughs) I did kick into the Kickstarter for that. So if you watch the end credits of the Blu-ray restoration, my name amongst a bunch of other people turn up. That's cool. Um... I'm trying to think of anything else relevant about the movie other than woof. Woof. <laughs> I know it's got a lot of pacing issues. I think you could probably shorten the movie up to about 45 minutes. Um, just because there's a lot of start and stop uh, editing. A lot of things can make, be made smoother. Yeah. I mean, yeah, It definitely has the feel of, and I'm sure it was done this way just by the what you just told me about that it was basically on a bet it has the feel of someone who hasn't really done this type of a project before but has a vague idea of how to go about it and is generally an organized enough person that they think they can pull it off but like i can just see that they clearly were like showing up to places they were going to film <laughs> and then they're like okay we're here now what do we do oh where's the bag with the script okay i don't know if that's there okay well well we look for that just 
walk around vaguely and look a little dazed and and disoriented in the desert, you know? And so you get these shots or these scenes that it cuts back to that was clearly like, oh, I see where they got that footage from. Or some of the scenes where they're traveling by car. Oh, man. And I'm pretty sure that that's other people's footage of traveling by car because they just don't always line up. Like, they clearly try to make it line up with like, oh, going through a a tunnel now or something so it can get dark and then get light and be somewhere else. But you conveniently never really see any of the people in the car as the scenery is going by so that, you know, if it wasn't the same one, oops, that, that'd work okay too. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it definitely was put on by somebody who knew that they could do it. It wasn't that hard. I used to Maybe learn their lesson? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. So I used, I used to think I'd be a filmmaker when I grew up. I haven't said that in a while because we haven't podcasted in a few weeks. But I used to think I'd be a filmmaker when I grew up and, and to that end, I'd be running around town with my friends in a camcorder, making little movies, that sort of thing. And I used to believe that if somebody really were to sit down and think about it, everybody knows how to make a movie because we've watched so many movies, we know how they're made. We know how to put that together. Yeah. I think Mono Sahans of Fate shows that that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. That it takes a lot more than just having watched a lot of movies. Uh, to, to, to kind of know what you're doing. And our friend Dominique, mm-hmm. I'm going to invoke her real quick. Just she, she does not like Monos. Not that she finds it dumb or boring or a bad movie. It, if I can speak for her, really unsettles her. Okay. She feels like it's like one step away from a snuff film. <laughs> okay. Uh, I say as I giggle. And I think it's MST3K who makes a joke that every frame of this film feels like the last known footage of everybody <laughs> involved in that shot. Uh, it does have a real unsettling, grainy kind of, we aren't supposed to be seeing this vibe in spots. Yeah. And in other spots, you're like, okay, it's a long stretch of road. <laughs> this movie has gone on, like I said, to, to generate a cult following. Um mm-hmm. A theatrical version have, of it has been produced in Oregon, because of course, there has been a felt puppet version of this movie, Manos the Hands of Felt. I own that on DVD. Yes, I did contribute to that Kickstarter as well. <laughs> uh, back when money was a little different. Um, it has not had a remake, but there has been at least one semi-official sequel in that Jackie and uh, Diane, who played them, Diane Mari, I think is her last name. I can't remember how it's pronounced, who plays the mother, uh, as well as her father, you know, Jackie's father, Tom, could be back as the master, appeared in a movie called Monos Returns. And that was shot here in Oregon. Jackie actually lives in Oregon. She's been on the show a few times uh, as well. She's a friend of Monster Kid Radio. And she actually does now like an online painting class with some of the people that are involved with Mystery Science Theater 3000. So like once a month, you can pay to join her painting class and you all paint a monster from a classic monster movie or okay, cool. a pulpy, rift <laughs> monster movie, which is kind of cool. I think there's a lot of really cool stuff in the movie. And I don't know what it is about it that I just, maybe it's the DIY-ness of it bleeding through. I don't know. There's just something about it that just charms me. But you were giggling a lot. <laughs> well, I mean, it definitely falls into a lot of the tropes that that we see in horror movies of the time. I was, I definitely felt like there were some strong nods to different pieces, in, including, I feel like a little bit from Psycho, where you know they come in in the car and they're looking for someplace in particular and then it, it, at the end we get that call back okay to yeah. that so that that had that in itself has kind of a, a nod to psycho and that and there you know there are other places where it was just things like um the the dad's just like yeah so it's all cool right we'll just like come inside and and torvo's very much like no no not cool don't do that that will be bad Please don't do that, you know. And he's like, yeah, yeah. So we'll just come inside, right? And, and like the wife and kid are like, yeah, no, this seems a lot like gonna die horribly. How about we don't? And he's like, yeah, yeah, we'll just go inside. 
it just I, you you wouldn't find a character like that in a movie these days. I can't tell if it's like they're they're playing up this small town Texan hospitality assumption or what. But yeah, it's very like no, we'll just come and the master would not approve. Oh, whatever. We can say he's not going to turn us out, right? Torgo, go get our luggage. All right. Yeah, no, they, not they get the luggage you know, and they do this shtick with the luggage back and forth like like is this a Mel Brooks movie or is this, you know, what is this? Go get our luggage. Okay, we're, what, we're going. What, okay, no, we're not. Wasn't your hump on the other side? What hump, you know? Like, ah. that's what I'm waiting for. Well, so let, let's talk about Torgo and his hump or uh, misshapen legs. Yes. What did you think of that? Interesting but strong character choice, and he played it all the way to the end, so I, I give him props for that. But yeah, whatever drugs that poor dude was oh. on. So he was wearing leg braces. They, these were a contraption that he intentionally put on, and again, popular wisdom is, is that they really messed him up. Yeah, yeah. Whatever what was left of his life lifetime pain. Um, he had a really, and we'll talk about this in a second, he had a really tough time, but some stories say that the intention was to, that he was a satyr, that he wasn't human. You are not one of us. Oh, that he's okay. a satyr, a goat person, and that's why he's got these weird misshapen legs. Oh, Other stories say, no, he was supposed to be a, like the humpback assistant, but a hunchback is so stereotypical, let's mess up his legs instead. And Originally, he was supposed to be called Igor, but not really. So I, I yeah. don't know what's true. Yeah, there. I definitely got the feel that he was yeah. that assistant in that way. And he, uh, his, his father was uh, the, the actor, John Reynolds. Like you said, he had a really hard time of it. Um, his father wanted him to go to military school, was not a big su- a support of the, uh, now he wants to get on the stage and do theater and all that. Yeah. Which I'm not saying, mon- I, I want to make sure it's clear. Yes, he committed suicide. It wasn't because of Manos. <laughs> It probably had something to do with the drugs. And, I think you don't get to that point from just one thing yeah, like that. Yeah, you know, but it's sad. For a long time, there was this urban legend that everybody involved in Manos disappeared. Nobody heard from them again. They, they all killed themselves or ran away or whatever. And there was even a mini documentary called Hotel Torgo that was about that. Yeah. Jackie, who played Debbie, saw Hotel Torgo and reached out to the filmmakers and was like, um... I'm still here. A lot of us are still here, but they didn't do anything about it. So, sure. But does anybody really care about the wives after? Oh, oh no. Oh, I'm kidding. The wives. But yeah, the wives. Like they clearly had one person design all their dresses. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a flattering choice for I mean, variety of body types and and heights and stuff. Sure. Okay. You know, I I was watching the movie with a different eye yesterday i've seen the movie so many times sure when i was doing the movie stream which will be coming back i would even show it on there and i would show it in black and white Mm -hmm. which actually makes it a lot creepier i feel like it it really yeah it gives it a whole different shade but i was really watching it with a, a different eye yesterday and there were little things here and there that i didn't pick up on before or have never really stood out to me as being important as part of the story and the descent amongst the wives of Manos really stood out to me this time more so than normal though we can't kill her she's a little girl but she'll turn into a woman and that's what we need but she's a little kid the back and forth there which like I said I hadn't really paid too much attention to that before of course when you watch Manos I think you're drawn to Torgo immediately and then everything else is superfluous so this time that really stood out to me. It's just creepy. Yeah. The 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 question of what do we do at this point? Are we going to kill a little kid? I'm glad they, spoiler, they didn't. But what fate did they leave her to? Yeah. You know, that's kind of disturbing. Um, also, I don't know if I've never really noticed just how gruesome Torgo's fate is. Yeah, I mean, I knew they that his hand comes off and he catches fire and runs off into the desert night. But the master holding Torgo's hand, waving it around, <laughs> around like it's poop on a stick that he's shaking at the other kid. Right, like, but it's kind of bloody too, and I guess I never really noticed the gruesomeness. Oh, of that. see, I recognize that that whole scenario looks exactly like stuff that happens at, at the haunted houses about fifteen times a season when they. 
first make a prop, then somehow illuminate or inflame it, whether they're supposed to or not. And then it becomes, look what I did, look what I did. Like they're very impressed with themselves. So no, that's, that's yeah. That's somebody who's very proud. I, I think the master made that prop himself, <laughs> I'm just going to say. I love the staff. I love Torgo's staff. That just ends with that weird looks like it was spot welded out of a piece of sheet metal hand shape. Yeah. And there are a handful of shots. And again, watching it with a different eye, there's a lot of just close-ups of the master's face and the hand passing in front of the camera. And it's got that hole in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of see the master through the hole as it's passing through. And I just thought that they accidentally came up with some good camera work. Yeah, yeah, no, there's some cool things in there. And there are some scenes that really do suck you in, but then there's just all the moments that don't don't hold up because they're not made by a professional movie house that knows how to make movies. You know, and I wonder how much of that goes back to the script. And, but I, I don't know. I guess I, the director also wrote it, so I don't know. But there's a lot of things that happen in the script that just... I don't know. I'd love to read the original script. Supposedly it exists somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, at one point a few years ago, somebody tried to claim that the script had a copyright on it, which would have kept the movie out of the public domain. I think that ultimately got dropped, that whole case thing did. I'm not sure 100% how that resolved or if it just kind of fizzled out. But uh, I, I do wonder how much of what we heard was in the script, because once they're sitting there in the booth to record all the dialogue, they could have said anything. That's true. Well, and as evidenced by how Warren's saying, we could just redo the audio and make it a comedy. That's absolutely true, and there are definitely a few points, particularly close up with with the parent couple, where they're not saying what's been said. I, I can just tell that it's not just that the timing doesn't line up. They say clearly more words than what we hear come out of the speakers, and so it's clearly that something has been changed in the script there, and, and I wonder what that would have been. There are some moments where it lines up perfectly. So every once in a while, these little happy accidents that show competence at the beha- mm-hmm. <laughs> behind the filmmakers. And maybe that's why I like part of the reason why I like some movies so much is I'm, I'm constantly cheering it on, wanting it to be successful. And you get these happy little moments, the, the close up of the master's face or the dialogue lining up just right, which really we probably shouldn't cheer too much as what's supposed to happen in most movies anyway. But when they pull that off, I'm like, oh, yeah, they, they can do it. They they can really do it. Are they going to do it this time? Even though I've watched it over and over again, the ending's not going to change. I know how it ends. But there's just this this want for that movie to be successful for me when I watch it. And and so I think, yeah, for aspiring filmmakers, even if they're hobbyist filmmakers at this point in their lives or hobbyist sound techs, you know, at some points in their lives, you, you can still appreciate that and everything. And then there's others who are kind of watching it like they watch NAS- NASCAR, just waiting for the big crash. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. So was there a big crash moment in the movie for you? Um, I mean, yeah, I think in the, I think if people haven't seen it, I don't want to totally ruin what happens, but, but yeah, the, there was a, a, a nice, kind of big climactic scene where I was drawn in there towards the end. Okay, so I gave a spoiler warning at the beginning of our conversation. Oh, okay. I so mean, I'm curious when... I mean, the big scene, when they finally get to the point with the altar and they're going to do the sacrifices and everything and so much is going on, I think that moment re- reads really true and well and, and you're really pulled into the action and you forget for that moment that what you're watching is an extremely low budget cobbled together, you know, theater club type group of people trying to pull something off and i've owned theaters so that's not even a dig it's just i know what that looks like with with that type of group of creative people all working together at madcap's pace just to get something done like that it's you know it is nice when you find those moments of beauty in it that can really draw in the audience moments of beauty sounds a lot better than happy accident (laughs) both you know but that's good that's for me, that's what Mono says. There's a lot of little happy accidents here and there. I think the the lore, the myth of Manos is so much bigger now than the film itself. Uh, th- there have constantly been talks about doing other Manos projects. I know that Jackie herself has been involved in a number that have either 
stalled out, are still in production, never happen, never never got off the ground, whatever. I know a lot of people have tried to do things with Manos over the years. Even our friend Steve Sullivan has written not one but two adaptations of the film mm -hmm. as as a novel. One as a straight up adaptation of the film, uh, kind of the, the funny version, I suppose is what he calls it. And uh, forgive me, Steve, if I'm getting that wrong. And then the serious version of it as well, as if he's trying to kind of course correct and make it a real scary story. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll make sure there's links to the show notes to those books if people haven't picked them up or are interested in checking those out. I find the movie ins strangely inspiring, and, and I don't want to say what's coming up for Monster Kid Radio and Team Death regarding Monos just yet, but I do implore our listeners to stay tuned, uh, because not next week, but the week after that, we're going to have Chris McMillan on the show to talk about some stuff going on with Monos, and, and I'm really excited about that. Yeah, it uh, it sounds like he's got his hands on a uh, wow fun little project that that might be highlighted wow. for us. Wow, how long have you been waiting on that one? Pretty much the whole time we've been recording. <laughs> wow. All right. All right. So it's been a while since we've done anything for Monster Kid Radio. It's been a while since you've been on the show. I know I kind of joked a little bit about how's your life different now that we're married and all that. Uh, what is coming up for? Team Death. Anything you want to share? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm. It's, it's late spring, early summer, so I'm getting into the full swing for Halloween, of course. Uh, <laughs> to be fair, we started that on November first. That, yeah, that's, that's true. That was light planning, and, and now we're getting to the really serious uh, section of, of designing and crafting haunts and getting pieces all put together at big workshop that's that's well away from the actual scare park site so that when we get closer in everything can be thrown in and assembled quickly and put together and all at the same time that we're casting people and working with people if you are in the portland area there'll be more to come on that soon and then i continue to work with a life and arts theater company here in the portland area to bring uh, staged readings and full productions of things uh to stage for for local viewers we've got the rebirth of the youtube channel uh in the works some other writing projects and yeah i'm, I'm all about what's coming up in october with vendetta productions as scary grounds pdx i haven't talked to anybody there but i have no problem saying that monster kid radio is the unofficial official podcast of scary grounds pdx i hope they're okay with that uh but yeah we'll be talking more about the haunt as we get closer to it We'll make announcements about casting and auditions and things that you can do to be involved uh, in all things Scaregrounds PDX and all the other stuff we got coming up with Team Death. Yes, and to all of our listeners out there who have sent in their well wishes and, and kind thoughts, um, thank you very much. It, it It's really special for me and for us that we've had this time to spend together. And so taking a little break away from you know, live projects for Monster Kid Radio for a few weeks. So that was a really nice gift that all of you gave to me and to us as a couple. So thank you again to all of our listeners for that. You make it sound like they willingly was like, oh, go ahead and take a free few weeks off, Derek. No, I just, I just did it. I didn't. Well, I know, but you know, you're regular people. I know that they come to look forward to listening to you and everything. And it's been nice to have you all to myself for a little <laughs> bit. And I can share you with the world again. Yeah, yeah, well, and to be fair, Steve Turek did do that incredible run of like five weeks of MKR. Yes. While we were getting ready for everything. Big points to Steve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is it about Steve's and Monster Kid Radio? They all seem to be doing a solid. Must be that. Just the name. We just got to find more Steve. We need more Steve. Do you? <laughs> is that going to be the name of our fan? You know, like the Found Footage Festival of South Melinda. Do we have Steve's? Yeah, I don't know. We need an army of Steve's. This is getting weird. I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you for doing this, Beth. I appreciate you. Absolutely. All right, well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Monster Kid Radio. I'm super excited about getting this episode out to everybody, so I don't want to waste too much of your time. But I will remind you that you can find out everything you need to know about Monster Kid Radio in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net, where you're going to find links to everything that we've talked about here on the show. Every single episode of Monster Kid Radio can be accessed there as well. And our contact information can be found there as well. If you want to call and leave a voicemail for the podcast, you can call and leave your message at 360-524-2484. Or you can call and leave me an email. 
You can call and leave me an email. How does that work? You can write an email to monsterkidradio at gmail.com. And maybe we'll include that email or that voicemail if you call and leave a voicemail in a future episode of Monster Kid Radio. In fact, for the next two weeks, I would love to get some Monos flavored feedback. Speaking of Monos flavored, I think in the last episode of Monster Kid Radio, I actually asked everybody what they thought a Monos flavor would be. If something was Monos flavored, what would that flavor be? And Ed S. wrote and said, of course, they would be flavored like goat cheese. Well, that's a, that's a flavor. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I would like to include your Monos feedback in the next two weeks on the podcast. But if you have feedback about anything you've heard about on the podcast in the past, or just general feedback in general, or you know of a Monster Kid event that's happening in your area you'd like to invite people to, call in or shoot me an email and I'll make sure it gets mentioned in a future episode of the podcast. Speaking of the future, like I said at the top of this, this is only the first episode. We're doing two more episodes of Mono. So next week, Steve Turek is coming to the show, this time as a guest. He's going to join me in the guest's seat to talk about Mono's The Hands of Fate, and I'm told that he is uh, actually going the extra mile and has watched Mono's Returns as well as Mono's The Rise of Torgo. I have to admit, I don't think I was aware that Manos The Rise of Torgo was readily available for people to check out. I've not seen it myself yet, but I am going to make a point to watch it before I have a chance to talk with Steve so that he and I can talk a little bit about the prequel and then the sequel, Manos Returns, which is about as official as a sequel you're going to get. And I guess the prequel is kind of official too-ish since Jackie is in that as well. But that's going to be coming up next week and then the week after that, Chris McMillan from The Shadow Over Portland will be joining me for our third Monos episode. After that, we're taking a break from the master here on this podcast anyway, and we'll do something else. I'm not sure what, though, so stay tuned. Don't change that Monos dial. Come back to the same Monos place for more Monster Kid Radio. Until next week, remember, the Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC, all original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC. Is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song Manos, The Hands of Fate. That is copyright The Seatopians. It's from their album Underwater Ally. You can find them at theseatopians.bandcamp.com or just follow the link in the show notes. When you check them out, let them know that Monster Kid Radio sent you. My name is Derek M. Cook. The master has decreed that I will be back again in seven-ish days. Ciao.